So please join in welcoming Mr. Tom Ramos. Thank you, and thank you, Colin. All right, uh, we're on number three. And I remember when uh, finally our Naval Institute Press kind enough to decide to publish the book, uh, one of the questions I was asked is, well, Tom, what questions does your book answer that we can use? And I remember right away the first question I said that this book will answer is, how on earth did a cow town in Northern California end up being a site for a nation's nuclear weapons laboratory? That was the first question I had. And there were some others, which we'll cover later. Uh, but hopefully, at the end of today's lecture, you might know the answers to that first question. How, how did we end up here in Livermore being the site of a nuclear weapons laboratory? And let's find out. So when we, uh, we talked about the Manhattan Project in the last, uh, last lecture, and I took us right up to the end of the war and uh, one post war shot, but the, at, even during the last year of the war, uh, the, the people who were running the atomic program, Vannevar Bush, uh, Cantlin, um, Conan, some others, they were, they were already aware, what are we going to do after the war to maintain our United States dominance in, in atomic research, especially this, which would lead to an atomic bomb. And, uh, Bush had some ideas and he brought it into the Pentagon and the Pentagon got involved and he kind of treated it like a, basically like a continuation of a military operation. And there were two prominent JAG lawyers, JAG, Judge Advocate General if you're in the Army, those are Army lawyers. There were two prominent JAG officers at the Pentagon. I have their, I have their names up there. It, it's Royal and Marbury. They were graduates of Harvard Law School and they were called in and they were asked to put together a bill that would be presented for Congress to establish a new organization post-war to establish government rules for, for doing atomic research. And they went after it. And the product that they came out with was to establish a commission with nine members. Five members would be civilians. I think they were gonna be nominated by the National Academy of Sciences, uh, but four of the nine people in the commission would be uh, military officers, flag officers, which is military jargon, or a, cat or a general or an admiral uh, would be a flag officer. And so there would be a, dom uh, a, uh, a significant presence of the military in, like it was in the Manhattan Project. Of course, the Manhattan Project, remember, was being run by the War Department. And so that was the plan. And so the uh, Stimson was Secretary of War. He was retiring. He was replaced. His deputy was a man named Patterson. Patterson brought the uh, Royal Marbury Plan and brought it into Congress. They met with, uh, I think, believe, the uh, uh, Senator Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, and I think, oh, and uh, oh, doesn't matter. Uh, but they brought it. Uh, they brought it into Congress. Speaker of the House took it. Rayburn, that's it. Speaker of the House Rayburn got it, and they appoint, they gave it over to the military affairs committees, both in the Senate and in the House. These are what we later would call the Senate and House Armed Services Committees. But in that time, in those days, it was the military affairs committee, and those two committees were led by a Senator Johnson and a Congressman May, and they took it and they reformed it, and it became known as the May Johnson Bill, that went before Congress to establish this new commission to control uh, atomic research, especially with, with regards to nuclear weapons. Once it came out, and once the details of the bill started to be known, opposition to it grew rather rapidly. Uh, there was a lot of the aspects of the Manhattan Project still associated with the bill, and the military still had a significant uh, role to play, uh, and for example, I, I excerpt one sentence out of there. Where there was a fear a scientist could be arrested and fined ten thousand dollars for breaking a rule he didn't even know existed because everything, everything was so obscure, and much of the research would be considered top secret, as in line during the Manhattan Project. And this was not going over well, as you might imagine, with um, significant scientists, including Enrico Fermi. Fermi is uh, he's just He's in Chicago now. He's created an institute for nuclear physics up there and with others. Uh, Frank, 
Griffiths Frank was a, another prominent physicist there. And the, as once they read the repercussions of the May Johnson bill, they just became opponents to it. And things started getting louder and louder. It's about this time, maybe because of Fermi and other prominent physicists being in Chicago, but Chicago became a hotbed for opposition to the bill. And it's at this time a, a group was created by Frank. Uh, it's called the Federation of, of Atomic Scientists in Chicago. And at that time, they also created a bulletin, um, a bulletin for um, atomic scientists in Chicago at the same time. And of all things, based on an idea from Edward Teller, they included a, a, an item called a doomsday clock. And, and Teller's idea was we need to wake up scientists to the, how, how um, the Russians, you know, the communists, are going to be coming up and they're going to be providing, they're going to be doing uh, research that would also bring them up into becoming a nuclear power. And we need to know how dangerous this is and how important it is to our defense. Well, of course, the eventual meaning of the doomsday clock became just the opposite. It was how close are we to catastrophe. Now, the, it is a clock, but the bloody thing hasn't worked very well because they set it at 5 to midnight, I think, back in 1950 when it was created. I don't know what it is now, but sometimes it's gone back and forward. That's typically not what a clock does in my mind. The clock goes in one direction. It's more like a thermostat, you know, setting, setting a new temperature. And um, oh, and a warning here, truth and warning. Um, the bulletin once declared me a mini mind uh, back about 25 years ago. So if there are some things that I say that you disagree with or anything, just take it up with the bulletin because they've already labeled me. They've already got me scoped as a mini mind. And so what do you, what do you expect? showing up here. And all right, so there's opposition to this thing. And uh, the opposition goes into Congress. And there's, as I point out here, there's uh, Senator Brian McMahon. He's a first term senator from Connecticut. Lawyer comes in and he picks up on this. He has a deep interest in atomic energy research and comes up with an alternative Senate bill called the McMahon Act. Um, which would basically establish a commission, but these would be civilian commissioners. They would not, they would not have any military flag officers in uh, running the commission. And it would have control not only of nuclear weapons, but also all, it would be promoting atomic research in general. And it would be a lot less emphasis on the secrecy of a military operation in Macmillan's bill. And Macmillan's bill began to grow and gain momentum and gain more support. Uh, Senator Hoyt Vandenberg, for example, uh, he, was, he was one, however, he was a very conservative senator and held out for uh, more military uh, participation in uh, atomic research. And so he introduced an amendment to the bill which introduced a, uh, a, an assistant commissioner or an assistant Secretary for Military Affairs was called, and that person had to be a military officer, flag officer, that one position. And that military affairs position would be more or less in charge of handling um, nuclear weapons research within, within the government. And uh, there was some give and take, but going through 1945 into 1946, lots of arguments. I think I won't go into it for lack of time. But on August 1st, 1946, President Truman signed the McMahon bill into, into law, which was more popularly known as the Atomic Energy Act of 1946. Now, with the passage of that, they created an Atomic Energy Commission. And the commission would control, that organization would control um, all aspects of nuclear weapons research, as well as promoting atomic research in general. It would, be, it would promote, provide funding even to go to civilian colleges to conduct basic uh, atomic or nuclear physics research. Uh, the commission would be composed of four, uh, five commissioners, one chairman and four members, and they would be chosen by the president and approved by, by Senate, Senate confirmation. In addition, the act created, uh, this is also after a lot of the arguing about how much military participation would go, um, a military liaison committee. Is that what I have? I gotta make sure. Yeah, military liaison committee was created, the MLC. That would be an official organ in which 
the Defense Department at the Pentagon would transmit its requirements to the Atomic Energy Commission on the needs of the Defense Department for nuclear weapons. So this is by law, federal law created that. Now later, Congress would change its name to the Nuclear Weapons Council, which is something we might be more familiar with today. But originally it was called the Military Liaison Committee. But that Nuclear Weapons Council, which in fact I worked, which I remember uh, one time in my life, I had to work for the, for the Nuclear Weapons Council for two years. That was established essentially by the Atomic Energy Act. Uh, another thing is it formalized that you would have a general advisory committee placed in. The general advisory or the GAC, general advisory committee, was, had its first chairman was selected to be J. Robert Oppenheimer, and it was composed of prominent scientists who were intimately knowledgeable about, frankly, nuclear weapons. And this committee would then be the chief advisors to the commissioners on technical matters dealing with nuclear weapons, so that the commissioners had their own select committee to advise them on, on many of the technical issues that would be coming up with regards to nuclear weapons. Um, finally, the, uh, the act created a new, to, to control nuclear weapons information, so it doesn't just go out and get published in physical review or something. Uh, the, the act created a new form of classification called restricted data. Restricted data being data involved with the design of a nuclear weapon. Okay, then to control who has access to restricted data, uh, a bureaucrat was in, in the Atomic Energy Commission had to come up with a classification system. And as he was going through it, every applicant to work there, to get, to get their, their clearance to work there, had to fill out a personnel security questionnaire. In fact, many of us did it. I know I did. In fact, I think we called it SF-88. I think it was the number. Of, anyway, you had to fill out that personnel security questionnaire. So the, pure, the bureaucrat coming up with it just took the, took the letters at the top of the, quest, of the questionnaire and you had PSQ. So he said, well, a P clearance means you don't have a clearance, but it does allow you to work inside an Atomic Energy Commission facility, like here at the laboratory. Just to come in, do repair work, maintenance work, you don't necessarily going to see classified information, but that allows you inside the gate. That would be a P clearance. An S clearance would be a normal secret clearance. It would allow you to see normal national defense secret information. But if you wanted to have access to restricted data, data involved with the nuclear weapons uh, designs, then you'd have to have a Q clearance. And that's why we all have, many of us here have Q clearances, and that's where that term originated which came out right out of the Atomic Energy Act. All right, so now we're set up, get going. Uh, by the way, the, the first director, uh, the first chief uh, commissioner was Lilienthal, that gentleman right there, second to the left. And another gentleman I'm gonna be mentioning in this, if you look at the photograph to the far right, that's Louis Strauss. That's two of the more prominent names that will, that will be coming up in the story to come. All right, now, uh, as, I'm, as I was writing this stuff, trying to do research, came to the realization there's four or five things happening simultaneously all over the country and the world, and they're all leading in, they're all gonna lead, believe me, we're gonna eventually get to Livermore, but, uh, but there are things happening all over the place pretty much simultaneously, and I was having a dickens of a time trying to, how do I make a coherent story out of this thing, because there are, there are many things happening. So I'm gonna have to re you're gonna have to rely on your imagination and your minds to go, because I can't help it. I'm gonna be skipping around a little bit, because while the Atomic Energy Commission was being created by the McMahon Act, at the same time, back at, back at Los Alamos, uh, when the war ended, uh, Oppenheimer leaves, goes back to Berkeley, actually, and he's succeeded by Norris Bradbury, who ran some of the implosion, high explosive experiments during the Manhattan Project, uh, he's a naval, former naval reserve officer, and he, and he was actually studied at Berkeley and Stanford, got his degree, I think, out of Stanford. And he's now the new director at Los Alamos. And he declares uh, when, when uh, Bradbury takes over the laboratory, which now takes on a more formal name, instead of uh, just being Site Y, like it was used during the uh, Manhattan Project, now it's gonna be the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory or as many of us affectionately call it, LASL. Okay, so the new director of LASL 
is Norris, and he, he sets his priorities. His first priority is gonna be to modify and improve some of the ignition uh, aspects of the Fat Man device that was dropped over Nagasaki and, dro and tested in Trinity, and there are gonna be some modifications for that. Uh, not the least of which is uh, when the airplane carrying the bomb takes off, the question was, well, if the plane crashes, it, uh, does that mean the bomb will go off? And the way they avoided that in the beginning was they, they did not assemble, fully assemble the bomb until after the bomber was in the air far away, then they had a physicist aboard who would assemble it. Well, for military applications, that's not very practical. So they had to come up with a more or less safer system to have that bomb ready to be used and armed and all of that. And all of that needed to be developed and that was a natural, a natural mission for Los Alamos to follow. But another thing he wanted to do is Bradbury and Anas, he, he wanted to follow up or at least get his hands around the super. And uh, because during the Manhattan Project, work on a super led by uh, Edward Teller had not proceeded very much. In fact, had gotten very little beyond the theoretical aspects. And so Bradbury decided, well, let me get my arms wrapped around this thing and see what's his progress, is it worthwhile pursuing in that. So that became two of his chief motivations or two chief objectives, as he stated himself, at that. So following that, in 1946, just about six or so months after he becomes a director, he calls together a conference for the super to understand the super. And in, and in the course of doing that, he also entices Teller to come back from Chicago. You might remember that at the end of the Manhattan Project era, um, Oppenheimer told Teller that there's no, there's no need to develop the super anymore, and Oppenheimer pretty much put the damper on that. Uh, Teller tried to get Fermi to take over the program, but Fermi was more interested in going back to Chicago to create a nuclear physics institute. And so it was not, didn't seem to be much future, so Teller quit Los Alamos and went up to Chicago and joined Fermi up there. And Bradbury then makes an offer back to Teller to sign a contract, pretty make him a contractor to come back and continue his work on the super, now as a contractor. And Teller accepts, so Teller moves back to Los Alamos now in 46, just in time to supervise the 46 conference. And many of the former members of his group remember that group 15 during the war, um, we'd make presentations about this is how much progress we made in calculations during the war. And at the end of the conference, uh, Teller, writes, uh, Teller writes the conference report, and in his summary he says, the physics now shows that we know how to make the super, period, and end of story, go, go forward. Well, Rob Serber, who Basically, uh, he had replaced Oppenheimer as the lead theoretical physicist at the Rad Lab. When Oppenheimer went down to create Los Alamos, his replacement was a man named Rob Serber. Serber was there presiding over the conference too, and he had some questions that he wasn't quite as sure as Teller was that all the physics did point that we have a solution yet. And Serber expressed his, his reservations to that. More importantly, um, Bradbury too, when he Went through, the, went through the notes and he'd been listening in on the conference, was not sure that a super could be built. And what he, what he said, actually, uh, he quoted was, he didn't think it would ever appear in his lifetime in any case. So although he would continue uh, to ha manage research, what we now would call thermonuclear research at Los Alamos, at the beginning there was kind of this reservation about it um, that this may or may not work. And in fact, uh, uh, as I mentioned, Bradbury even stated he didn't think it was going to work, at least in his lifetime. But go ahead and do that. Third thing that Bradbury also wanted to pursue, by the way, and he brought that out, was basic science. He wanted to get Lassell to do some basic science in his, you know, as, as a takeoff from the nuclear weapons work that they had done during the war. And that was important for him. So, and as I have surmised, I ha I, this is not being written, but this is my own summation, I still believe that Oppenheimer had been a very, very important figure at Los Alamos, and his feelings were made very obvious that he was not in favor of conducting thermonuclear research. And I have to believe that Bradbury, Manley, his deputy, and other, mother, uh, Carson Mark, and other individuals that were in the management part of Los Alamos had to be affected by Oppenheimer's feelings about this. And it might have also been contributing why there might have been a lukewarm feeling about this thing called the super. 
Um, oh, one point, though. One significant thing that would come, become very important later, one of the participants in the conference was uh, a German expatriate citizen of Great Britain by the name of Klaus Fuchs. And he, he comes in, and he's, he's involved, very bright theoretical physicist. And during the conference, he gets together with Johnny von Neumann. I introduced you already to von Neumann, probably the preeminent mathematician of the 20th century. And the two of them get together, and they start working. And they actually come up with a design for the super at the end of this conference. And they get it patented. So there is a patent for the hydrogen bomb, if you will. It's back at Los Alamos vaults, and it's signed uh, by Klaus Fuchs and by Johnny von Neumann. It was kind of, it'll become very interesting in a little while. All right, now, now Teller is back at Los Alamos, he's under contract, and he now wants to put together a team, a more powerful team, to get the super designed, get, get that super developed into a weapon. And uh, <coughs> he reaches out outside of Los Alamos to bring in, uh, bring in some significant physicists to work with him. One of the first ones, uh, one of the first uh, physicists he calls is uh, George Gamow. Again, I've introduced you to him in earlier lectures. Shame on you if you didn't hear my earlier lectures and you don't know what I'm talking about, but that's your fault, that's not my problem. But George Gamow is one, uh, and then Big Bang, he gave, gave us the term Big Bang Theory and did other things. But Gamow comes from George Washington University. He was the head of the physics department there. He is a world-class physicist not because he said the Big Bang Theory, but because he actually did some really cool physics, came up with some of the earlier quantum, quantum mechanical solutions to radioactivity introduced by uh, Marie Curie, for example. He's done many other things. But uh, he arrives, and he is a dynamo. He comes in working with Teller. Then uh, Bradbury puts together, and he forms what he calls a director's committee to keep him informed of how progress is being made on a super. And he picks uh, Teller, of course, and Gamow. But he has the one member from the uh, Manhattan Project, one member of Teller's group during the Manhattan Project is Stanislav Ulam, who I'd introduced again to you in an earlier lecture. And Ulam is a, uh, uh, a Polish mathematician who had been uh, recruited by Johnny von Neumann. So those three individuals kind of become the heart and soul now of this super research that's going to be going on at Los Alamos and they're members of the Directors Committee. And uh, some of these I got actually, Gamow wrote an autobiography, and they're, it's almost like they're having fun, but Gamow is coming up with these crazy schemes, how to make all of these things work. You got three very powerful minds working together, and uh, they're coming up with all of these various schemes. But the big thing for me is, in January of 1950, Gamow and Teller co-write co a paper in which they actually come up with an honest-to-God design for what the super would look like. And I call this the classical super. This was the first concrete design for the super. Shows up in January 1950. Now, a uh, few months before that, something happens on the other side of the world. All right? Now, during World War II, a very prominent Russian physicist, Kapitska, he meets with Stalin and a committee, and he suggests to the chairman, Stalin, that Russia ought to be pursuing, or the Soviet Union ought to be pursuing an atomic program, uh, based on the papers that they read from Otto Hahn's experiments in Germany and from the Niels Bohr, John Wheeler article that I mentioned that was written, what, September 1st, 1939, about the importance of uranium-235, and it's possible to make a bomb from that. If you're, a, if you're a good nuclear physicist, it doesn't take that much to put two and two together and figure out how to do it. Russia had some pretty good physicists that knew how to put two and two together. So just as much as you had people like Lawrence in America trying to bang on the government's door saying, look, <laughs> if we're not careful, Hitler could have an atom bomb, so too Kapitska had a meeting with Stalin to say the same message. We need to start an atomic program. Stalin wasn't all that impressed, and he felt there's nothing that's going to happen in time to stop the Wehrmacht from overrunning Russia. So, but they created this program. Igor Kakachev became the head of it, and it became a backwater. It, it started, they started working, but it did not get all that much attention until 1945, where the rapid testing of three atom bombs by the United States suddenly woke up 
Stalin to the import military importance of this particular project. And so Kokachev's uh, uh, program suddenly goes from being a backwater to the main emphasis of Stalin, and it's so important that Stalin takes the head of his secret police, Beria, Venti Beria, and appoints him, you are now in charge of this thing. I want an atom bomb to work, basically. So Beria takes over, he's, he's a thug, and meets with Kokachev. And within a year, uh, they're ready to make a test. And uh, in fact, Kokachev writes later in, in a memoir that Beria warned him that if the test did not work, he and his entire staff would be executed right on the spot. So it's pretty important. And they, uh, so they, in August 29th, I think 1949, uh, in Kazakhstan, they detonate what later on the intelligence would call Joe One, and the Soviet Union becomes a nuclear power. All right, um, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence is uh, well. They do that. I should before I go on to Lawrence. Uh, that one gentleman that was a member of the AEC commission, I said his name was Louis Strauss. He had been pushing for a program for the Air Force to go out and collect samples in the air to see if they could detect nuclear tests going on. And he, act, and he got it, and he got it approved. And so the Air Force had a program going around, uh, which is now based in Patrick Air Force Base in Florida. Still exists. But anyway, in September, early September 1949, a B-29 bomber is flying with uh, filters attached to it, picking up the air, air particles uh, in the air. And boom, boom, they take it and they'll come back. They're stationed in Alaska. Um, but then uh, when they take off these filters, typically on a typical flight, when they look at the radioactivity of the filters, they usually measure about 50 counts per minute. And that's from natural radioactivity. Or if you have volcanoes, you know, I don't know if you people realize it, but a volcano does release radioactive matter into the atmosphere. And there's other sources from uh, cosmic rays and other sources that create radioactive elements up in the atmosphere. And so typically they pick up 50 counts per minute. On this one now, they picked up 85 counts per minute on this one particular filter. So they took it and flew it down to a laboratory in Berkeley, California, called Tracer Lab. It's on San Pedro Avenue, for you Berkeleyites. And, uh, and they took it down to the Tracer Lab, and Tracer Lab took the samples, and they saw radioisotopes in you know, that are indicative of a nuclear test. And within a few days, word of the results of that gets up to the White House, and President Truman is briefed. And then, uh, within a week, then there are newspapers all over the nation announcing that the Soviet Union has now detonated an atomic bomb. And this happens just as Lawrence is taking off for a weekend. He's going to enjoy a quiet weekend in Yosemite National Park. And he goes down. Uh, he's in Merced, stops at a stoplight, and he happens to notice the newsstand. And there are the headlines in big letters, Reds Test A-Bomb. Lawrence picks up the paper and reads it, finishes his weekend in Yosemite, comes back to Berkeley. And at the uh, university cafeteria, he's sitting there with Louis Alvarez and with a chemistry uh, professor there, and the three of them are discussing this stuff on, on the news, and especially Lawrence and Alvarez know full well about the super and other kinds of things going on, and uh, in their discussions, they realize just as much, I mean, a feeling comes within Lawrence just as much as when he was first became aware of nuclear fission that that could lead to an atomic bomb then the news that the Soviet Union was now an atomic power in his mind led to, well, it's only a matter of time before Stalin would have a hydrogen bomb, a thermonuclear weapon. It's, it has to be, it sure, and, it, and, and actually his feelings were absolutely true. The Soviets did in 1946 create at their National Institute underneath a physicist named Tam, they did create a uh, thermonuclear program to create a therm thermonuclear weapon. So he was, his feelings were, he was right spot on the Soviets would be doing that. And once again, he had the feeling that you we cannot allow a tyrant like Stalin, in this case, instead of Hitler, now Stalin, have a weapon and be the only one in the world having this very powerful weapon. And he felt he needed to wake up the government once again to a threat that would be coming, 
coming down towards the United States. So this is happening, and when news of the, the, the Russian test gets out, congressmen, senators, everyone's asking, putting in questions, and they're hitting the, the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. Well, now what? What's happening? You know, what do we do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? The Russians got the atomic bomb. And uh, Lilienthal, who is still the chairman, has to work on that. Before I go on, now, this is all happening, my first bullet here. Uh, while this is happening, news of the Soviet test, another news item hits the newspapers, and that's that Klaus Fuchs, that gentleman who has the patent on the hydrogen bomb, the British arrest him for being a Soviet spy. So Fuchs is identified, he's a Soviet spy, and he'd worked in the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos. And so it was very clear, practically everything we knew about the atom bomb and the super, the Soviets knew too, through Fuchs, as this became uh, uh, general information. And, as the, and um, another thing that hits, the third thing that hits in terms of bad news is the communist government of China is created under Mao Zedong. They, 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 they found they win their civil war over the nationalists. And, when, and when the, uh, within a few weeks, Mao Zedong travels to Moscow, and he, he spends a month in Moscow as a guest of Stalin, and in fact, appears in Red Square in those big parades, and before the crowd, announces the eternal partnership and allegiance of China and Russia, or China and the Soviet Union, for the, for the furtherance of the communism, that communism will march on and eventually become a world it will become the world's government. And so the, uh, the Iron Curtain, the image of the Iron Curtain stretching down over Europe, separating Eastern Europe from Western Europe with the communist world to the east and the Western world being the democratic world to the west. Now, now the pundits were putting on, we now have a bamboo curtain that stretches around China. And now includes, now you have the Eurasian continent that most of the Eurasian continent now falls under a communist government. So this stuff's growing really quick. That gets, that gets also a lot of attention within, within the United States. Okay, so they hit the Atomic Energy Commission. Lilienthal says, all right, he calls up Oppenheimer, who's the head of the GAC, you know, the General Advisory Committee that's supposed to be their experts. He says, I want you to form a council or committee meeting together and evaluate the super. See, whether or not we should be pursuing the super in light of the Russians now having an atomic bomb. So Oppenheimer obliges, they, they call a three-day conference together, but Oppenheimer takes over and he pretty much kind of dominates the meeting and you can see that because he writes the formal report of the three-day meeting. And I, I wrote here in yellow, you can see it, uh, this, this is actually a quote right out of it, the GAC has considered where to pursue the development of the super bomb no member was willing to endorse this pr proposal. That the GAC said, no, you should not. And this really was based more on moral grounds than I think more in technical. Now, I know there are a lot, in fact, when I gave these lectures six years ago, I was challenged by someone in the audience, said, but wait, uh, Oppenheimer changed his mind once he got to see the new calculations. Uh, no, 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 no. It was always possible that the super would work. And Oppenheimer had moral convictions against it, and he was set out to delay or to stop the government from pursuing thermonuclear research. And his reasons, as I point out up there, is one, it's technically extremely difficult, but two, if we were to pursue it, then the Russians are, will pursue it. Otherwise, they, maybe they won't do that, which was, as we, as we now know, that was already, uh, already wrong. The Russians were already pursuing it. In fact, if anything, they were pursuing it ahead of the Americans. Um, so the Issue then went on, uh, O'Brien, Senator O'Brien, Louis Strauss, other members went and said, this is not good, because uh, Lilienthal Lil was happy to say, okay, we're not gonna pursue it, but uh, uh, others pursued it, and then eventually it went up to the national security staff of the president, and the president formed a special committee with the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, and the, the Commissioner of the Atomic Energy Commission, Lilienthal, and three of them met, and they pretty much decided, no, this is not 
this is not good, we should not delay that, we should start to pursue thermonuclear research. That leads to, in January of 1950, the same month that Gamow and uh, Teller present their first model for the super, President Truman directs the Atomic Energy Commission, orders them to now develop the super. So there no, should be no more arguments going on. All right, so back at Los Alamos, uh, I mentioned the three members of the Directors Committee and one is Stanislav Ulam. I should bring that back a little bit more. I'm gonna go back to that gentleman. He was born now, maybe many of us now would know, recognize the city. He was born in the city of Lviv, which at that time when he was born was a part of Poland, not a part of Ukraine there. But he's from there. He's a Polish mathematician. He's a real, uh, exp uh, he's just, he's in love with mathematics. He joins mathematics clubs. He becomes an extremely accomplished mathematician. And Johnny von Neumann discovers him and brings him to America, brings him to uh, uh, Harvard. And he becomes a uh, fellow at, at Harvard where he meets David Griggs. And then um, uh, Ulam gets a job being a professor of mathematics at the University of Wisconsin. And then finally, von Neumann brings him down to Los Alamos. He's working there. Now he's still a member. Now he's a member of the Directors Committee on the Super. And at about this time, just before, he also had a job offering at UCLA. And while he's in Los Angeles, he contracts encephalitis. He's in the hospital suffering from this because they're going to open his head to relieve pressure in that. And so his doctor tells him, don't think. Okay, well, <laughs> this, is, this is like telling, don't breathe. You know, and Ulam can't, can't do that. He's laying in bed and he's going stir crazy trying to do something, so he starts uh, playing solitaire. Someone gives him a deck of cards, and he starts playing solitaire, and he plays solitaire. And being the mathematician he is, he, he starts asking himself, what are the odds of me winning a solitaire hand if this is the configuration of the opening hand? If I have these cards here and I have this card here, what are the, what's the probability I could, I could win this solitaire game? And he starts trying to do these calculations, and he gets an idea that there's so many variations to this it's impractical, but what might be more useful if he, if he records the starting positions of the cards and plays the game and see if he wins or not, and then do it again, and then do it again, and then keep track of each time you play the game, knowing the starting conditions, did I win or did I lose? And from that, after a while, you would build up a statistical base, and based on a statistical base, you can then come up with probabilities of winning at solitaire. So that's what he did in bed, in recovering from encephalitis, but when he got back to Los Alamos, the idea kept in his mind, and then he, he transferred it to saying, well, instead of tracking playing cards and whether I'm gonna win solitaire or not, what if I track a neutron inside the super and just watched it bounce around, and I know the probabilities that it would have of being absorbed or causing a fission or this or that. I know all these individual probabilities, so I just track this neutron to its death, or whatever that may be, maybe it escapes, maybe it doesn't, and boom, and I, and I record it, and then I do it for another neutron, and then another neutron. And if I do it for enough neutrons, I'll build up a statistical base, and then I would know what would happen to a flux of neutrons going through the device, and I can actually predict how it would behave. And so he presents this idea. Now, it would be, seems to be pretty impractical doing millions of calculations for millions of neutrons, except that right at this time, the digital computer had been inv invented. Now you could do millions of calculations fairly rapidly, and so Ulam's ideas seemed suddenly to be very pertinent. And another member of the group, uh, Nick Metropolis, another mathematician at Los Alamos, gave a name to this kind of way of, systematic way of doing calculations. He called it a Monte Carlo calculation because he said it, it kind of looked like a game of chance, the way you were going, and indeed it did. And so these Mont Monte Carlo calculations then took over. And Ulam, in January 50, you had Gamow and Teller presenting their idea for super, um, he then uh, applies that idea and he gets a friend from Wisconsin where he, where he had been teaching every, and he gets an army of calculators and they start applying basically a Monte Carlo kind of calculations onto the super that Tella and Gamma had built and in March of 1950 he writes a paper and on the front page of it it says the idea is a fizzle in other words, it ain't gonna work. This dog won't bite. Teller is livid. Teller <laughs> reads the report, and here's this thing he's been promoting since 1943, 
and he's got this mathematician saying it ain't going to work. And so he's, it, in fact, um, Ulam writes a letter back to von Neumann telling him, uh, I saw Edward today, he was pretty furious, but I think it's okay, he's still going to talk to me kind of thing. But Ulam, by the way, was not against the super. If anything, he was, the, uh, he was more determined than ever to make it work. And so he had an idea, and he takes his idea in to Tella, and to, uh, Tella listens to him, and then listens. And because maybe uh, this happens after I have it up there, you know, Beta comes in, looks at Ulam's calculation, and says, Ulam's right. Fermi comes in and does a whole series of calculations again, comes back and tells Teller, Ulam is correct. And then even von Neumann himself, uh, he has this maniac computer back in Princeton. His wife, uh, Clary, is a math uh, can write algorithms for computers. She writes an algorithm to do it, blah, blah. And uh, even von Neumann comes back and tells Teller, Ulam is correct. So Ulam's kind of in a uh, depressed mo mode, if you will, uh, whether, whether or not this would happen. But in that kind of mode, when Ulam comes back and tells him this, then he's more receptive to the idea. Now, I've got to be careful here. This is an unclassified lecture. So, uh, but what Teller, oh, I'm sorry, what Ulam thought about was, well, wait, um, what if I took the atom bomb, that's going to need, that's going to start the burning of the secondary. Remember, that's, that's what happens with fusion. You have to raise the temperature high enough so you start fusion reactions. So, so, uh, so instead of just thinking of it as something that's going to ignite like a match and, you know, uh, like that, what if we, what if we thought about that you use the uh, atom bomb to implode another atom bomb next to it, now the energy from an atom bomb would really compress the second atom bomb so much more than a high explosive would that you would get much more atomic yield out of the second secondary, what he called the secondary. So the first atom bomb he called the primary would then squish a second atom bomb, which he called the secondary, and you'd get a more yield of it. That was his basic idea. And Teller took that and rearranged it and said, well, what if instead of another atom bomb, what if we actually did use a secondary that was a thermonuclear fueled secondary. This actually was something like the super, not the same thing, but it was thermonuclear fuel, and we would implode the thermonuclear fuel, use the radiation from the primary to radiatively implode the secondary. Then that might make the super work. Now, at this time, he had another friend he had recruited. His name was John Wheeler. Came Wheeler is another, one of the greatest physicists in America in the 20th century. Wheeler arrives. He brings with him uh, one of his post uh, docs, a guy, man by the name of Ken Ford, and they're working on this thing. And Wheeler need, wants to get back to Princeton. He wants to get his life back. He, he spends almost a year at Los Alamos, and he makes a deal with the Atomic Energy Commission to start a program. They'll call it the Matterhorn Project. And he'll go back to Princeton, he'll get a covey of uh, physicists together, and they'll start doing calculations on the super back at Princeton. And they give a name to this project, it's called Matterhorn, or the Matterhorn B. And so they do. He gets a contract, he goes back to Princeton, Ford then writes a thermonuclear code to try out this new idea that, that Teller and Ulam put out in March of 51. After, the, after Teller calmed down and realized what Ulam was saying, he took his idea, Ulam and Teller write this paper, and then Ford then writes a, starts writing a code and doing calculations. Will this thing work? It's kind of in parallel to what Ulam had done a year earlier. Now, some of you I know all along have doubted and I've, that my authenticity in giving you this history, whether or not you think I'm telling you the truth or not. So as a precaution, I went and met with Ken Ford and his lovely wife, Joan, and had a picture of me taken with him. So take it there. There it is. There's living proof. I'm there. I got, I got the word right from the horse's mouth. That's Ken Ford. He is talking to Tom Ramis, and I'm giving you the truth, OK? So I don't want to hear any more rumors about Tom's full of it, all right? I'll show you more pictures if you're not careful. <laughs> Ken's still happily married, and he's still quite alive, and he's, he's living in, in Pennsylvania. All right, anyway, Ken does these calculations at night in New York at the IBM offices, takes the train back and forth, and then Again, the pressure's building up, so Oppenheimer is asked to create another conference to consider the super, just like he had done back earlier. And so they do form this. This one's going to take place in Princeton, though. And so they form this thing up. But this time, now you've got Ford's calculations. 
Ford gives them to Wheeler. Wheeler then makes a presentation before the GAC, and he shows him Ford's calculations, and it shows it works. It would work. And those calculations, uh, with that, the GAC totally reverses itself and says, we now recommend the Atomic Energy Commission should pursue a thermonuclear weapon. And right then and there, the Atomic Energy Commission says, okay, we're going to do it, and it will be the mic, it will be called the mic device in a mic event. So we're going to do that. This will be totally dedicated to a uh, thermonuclear, testing a thermonuclear weapon. And meanwhile, Teller, in the midst of all of this, Teller gets involved in all of these fights back at Los Alamos. He's more agitated than ever that Los Alamos is not pursuing the super ideas as much as they would. For example, they, back at Los Alamos, they were not, nobody was hopping up and down after Teller and Ulam had written that paper in March 51. And so Teller is kind of flustered, and he quits once again, and he goes back to Chicago to join family. Uh, all right, meanwhile, like I said, there's lots of parts to this puzzle. And uh, Lawrence had, after, after he, he read that newspaper account, and he went back to Berkeley, and he met with Alvarez, they were going to go up to Washington and do some stuff, and they agreed, well, let's go to Washington. We need to convince government officials to support the super program. But first, let's go back to Los Alamos and get an update on what's happening. So they do, back in October. While they're there, Ulam tells Lawrence, we need more tritium to make this thing work. And so Lawrence comes away, gets the idea that they need tritium. And maybe that's where the Rad Lab can help. So he has this idea, I can create tritium by using a nuclear reactor. I think I'll skip the physics for this, but they're gonna, he's going to build a heavy water reactor in Sassoon Bay, up where the mothball fleet was. Okay, So they're going to do it. But Oppenheimer kills it. Oppenheimer says, no, I will not support that. And Alvarez, who is the head of the project, comes back and tells Lawrence, well, it ain't going to happen. Lawrence is not deterred. Instead of making a reactor, he thinks, well, I wonder if I can make tritium using an accelerator instead. And he goes himself back to AEC, meets, and he gets, he gets approval, and he gets funding to build an accelerator, puts Alvarez in charge of it again, and they call it the mass test accelerator, which is after a mass test, mass test reactor that's being built up in Idaho. And you see a picture of it being built there. Um, it's too big for Berkeley, so Lawrence goes back to the Pentagon and he says, uh, do you have any government property available that I can build this accelerator? And they say, yeah, pick any of the uh, World War II bases in your area. So Lawrence and Alvarez go touring around. They go to Camp Parks and visit the Army Post in Dublin, and okay. Then they come out to Livermore to the Naval Air Station in Livermore, and there's a big indoor swimming pool, Olympic-sized swimming pool, which is used to train Navy pilots to survive. And according to Alvarez, they step in, Lawrence looks at this big swimming pool, and he looks and he goes, Louis, we found it. This is it. So the reason you're here, <laughs> the reason you're here you now know is because of a bloody swimming pool just down the block. That's what, that's what sold them on make, you know, but it was a square mile of territory. There was a big runway. There were lots of barracks. And so Lawrence says, okay, we'll put the accelerator here. So that became building 431, that mass test accelerator. If some of you physics, Wolfgang Panofsky is the man who designed it, uh, who is another close friend of Alvarez. That's another name in physics history that came out here and did it. And in the meantime, Alvarez also sends a message back to Los Alamos. How can we help the super program? And he's told, well, we could sure use diagnostics. We could sure use some diagnostic instruments that could detect thermonuclear reactions going on. And so uh, Lawrence and Alvarez then create a group called the Measurements Group, specifically to build diagnostics for nuclear tests to see if they could detect um, fusion reactions going on. And here is the measurements group. Again, it's too big in Berkeley, so they move out and they occupy a barracks building across the street from the MTA. So now you have two things out here in Livermore from the Rad Lab. These are both Rad Lab operations. By the way, in that, uh, if you look the fourth row up, third face from the right, there's Ernest Lawrence in there. And Herb York, who he asked to lead this thing, is in the last row on the left. And you can see Herb York's picture. So watch carefully. These are pretty shady characters because later on these guys would be working for the laboratory. So if you see some, they're kind of shady, I know, but that's how we got started with this place. So there's the first Rad Lab presence in Livermore. Now, um, oh boy, one more story. And I'm, 
we're running out of time, sorry, I knew I had two extra graphs, but there's so much to cover and to put all these pieces of the puzzle together. But Hap Arnold was uh, General of the Army Air Forces in World War II, and at, towards the end of the war, he goes to his advisor, his chief ad scientific advisor is Theodore von Kahneman. And he asked von Kahneman to write a report, what should the Air Force be looking for in the future, at the end, after this war? And von Kahneman writes a two-volume report back to Arnold. The chief part of it's called uh, uh, beyond, uh, Toward New Horizons. But the one principal aspect of this report is the Air Force needs to create an organization of scientists and, and analysts that connect the Air Force to science so that as science is progressing, in the report, by the way, von Kahneman predicts ICBMs. He predicts more nuclear physics. He says, we have to be aware of what's going on in science and apply that immediately to the Air Force if the Air Force wants to remain relevant. And so Arnold basically decides to follow von Kahneman's advice. So right after the war in 1946, he takes one of his, one of his advisors, Kornborn, who works for Douglas Air, uh, Douglas Aircraft, and Kornborn is given the mission, all right, make this happen. And so Kornborn goes around and he meets with uh, the, the owner of Douglas who says, well, I'll tell you what, yeah, I'll donate our Santa Monica facility and you can have that to do this new organization. And so Kornborn goes back to Hap Arnold and says, all right, here it is for $10 million, we can create this organization. And the chief uh, engineer at Douglas Aircraft Craft. His name is Raymond. He comes up with an idea for this. He calls it RAND, which is a takeoff from research and development. So they start Project RAND, and Arnold says, okay, create it, and it starts at Santa Monica, California, and they go in. And I'm really impressed back at the MIT RAD lab during the war with the, the scientists he met there. When his first hire as a consultant is Louis Alvarez. He brings Louis Alvarez down. He also brings in Johnny Van Neumann, and to head his physics department, he brings our good friend, who I've mentioned to you all the time, David Griggs, then becomes the head of the physics department at RAND. And the military now is going to come weighing in. The Air Force wanted World War II tactics. If the Soviet Union does something, we'll just obliterate them. We'll do a massive air attack against them. So we need strategic warheads for our bombers, and they create the Strategic Air Command, specifically to go and bomb the Soviet Union if war broke out. Meanwhile, the Army's just gone through the Korean War, and they saw the almost total disintegration of Eighth Army with this huge human wave attacks from three Chinese armies that crossed over the border and attacked Eighth Army, almost obliterated Eighth Army. So the Army was reeling from this, and they wanted a uh, nuclear artillery shell that could, you know, not a big, massive, maybe a one kiloton type device that could go over and land in a formation of massed people, and you would disperse these massive human wave attacks and that would save us from being obliterated on the battlefield. And the Navy wanted to be part of this, but they don't have big bombers. They have fighter bombers that launch off aircraft carriers, so they need bombs that are much smaller. All three services are hitting Los Alamos for what they think is needed to, to, for their survival. And Los Alamos is totally being overwhelmed, so overwhelmed that the Air Force decides, screw it, we're going to create our own nuclear weapons laboratory and they try to make a deal with the University of Illinois to create another laboratory in Chicago, which is where Fermi is, of course. Uh, but that doesn't go too far. But, but anyway, there's obviously discontent. The, um, David Griggs, a good friend, von Kahneman, resigns as chief scientist of the Air Force, and he says, David, why don't you take my place? Griggs leaves Rand Corporation and becomes the chief scientist of the Air Force. Now they're involved with all these arguments going on. Due to lack of time, Colin is looking very nicely at me, but I'll stop. I'm not gonna go through all the details. You'll have to come in next year. But anyway, um, Griggs needs to get a strategy set down for the Air Force to meet the Soviet Union. And because of his friendship with Lawrence and Alvarez, he is very much aware of uh, the, 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 um, the super and what the super could accomplish, and that the Soviets are probably after it. And uh, in the meantime, Oppenheimer is still pushing, no, we don't do that, atom bombs are enough. And so Griggs basically becomes an opponent to Oppenheimer, pushing in. And he comes to the conclusion, there ain't nothing gonna happen under this stuff, we need another laboratory to push this. 
So Griggs recruits Teller, gets hold of Teller, introduces him to General Doolittle, who is the head of the Air Force Science Board, and he puts Teller inside the Air Force Science Board, and then Griggs sets up a meeting. Teller goes in, but Ernie Plissett and some other RAND Corporation people come in, and they start briefing the heads of our National Defense Forces on these new weapons coming out and how important they would be to the core defense of the nation. Bop, bop, bop. And Edward would get on and talk about the absolute need for another laboratory to, to do this. You know, Los Alamos is good, everything they do is, has been great. He says, but this task is going beyond the capabilities of Los Alamos. That message catches on, and meantime, we have a new, we have a new uh, chairman of the AEC. Len Lienthal is out, he was against it, but Gordon Dean comes in, he's for it. He wants a thermonuclear program, but he does not want a second laboratory. But now again, a meeting with the national security staff, you got the Secretary of Defense, you got the Secretary of State saying, no, we, we need something, things are not moving. Uh, especially the uh, Secretary of Defense, the Assistant Secretary of Defense, said he went out to Los Alamos, met with Bradbury, and he came away dissuaded that he didn't think Bradbury had his heart in this thing, but he went out to Berkeley, met with Lawrence, and he was convinced Lawrence would be a more, a more powerful source. So, a uh, commissioner from the AEC, a good Irish Catholic from Brooklyn, Tom Murray, uh, you don't, yeah, yeah, these people are hopeless, I can't even joke. But anyway, uh, Murray shows up, he meets with Lawrence and he convinces them, we need to start another laboratory for this thermonuclear stuff. And he says, the negativism in Washington is killing me. Lawrence agrees, he sends Herb York out to do a survey, York comes back, yep, we need one. So they said, okay, we'll do that. And they go back to Dean and said, well, let's create a second laboratory. Dean accepts, okay, we will accept the second laboratory, but what's its charter gonna be and where would we put it? The easy thing is where we put it, you put it near Lawrence. If you want something to work, Lawrence created UCRL. He created the MIT Radiation Laboratory. He was a kingpin in getting even Los Alamos started. If you want this, it has to go with Lawrence. And you already had your presence at Livermore. There's plenty of space out there. So place it in Livermore. That would make sense. That's close enough to Lawrence. That's where we'll put it. And then the charter will come up. Eventually, Teller didn't want to be part of it because he felt, if you're only going to make diagnostics, I don't want to be part of it. Lawrence met with Teller, convinced them otherwise, and Teller rejoined the laboratory. And then they insisted we need to be an independent laboratory capable of doing our own thermonuclear research. And Dean agreed to it eventually. And so now we're going to go ahead and create another nuclear weapons laboratory specific to meet this growing need. All right, now, next week we're going to hear, now that you got it like the, the dog chasing the fire engine, okay, you finally caught up to it, now what? You know, kind of thing. But next week we're going to then talk about the first days of the laboratory. Now we have a second weapons lab. It's gonna be created at Livermore. And now what happens? And it's not good news. So. Be prepared, next week may not be a comedy. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. All right, well thank you to our WebEx guests who attended. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A. I will probably reach out to Tom and see if he can answer them after the fact. Um, but here in the audience, if you'd like to stick around for a little bit and ask Tom some questions, uh, we'd be happy to do that as well. So thank you to our WebEx guests. Uh, we're going to stop the uh, uh, the recording, but then Tom will stay around to answer any questions for those that are here in person. Uh, we hope to see you next week.